Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, the twentieth ENSO uh, seminar. Um, it's my pleasure here to have uh, Randy Beer here from Indiana University, who's going to be giving uh, the, the the talk today. Um, as usual, we're going to wait uh, a few minutes to let people tune in and, and find the channel and everything. So uh, we'll just hang out for a little bit uh, while we wait for them to jo to join. Um, but rather than uh, having an awkward silence while we wait, we're trying a new format a little bit today uh, where we're going to uh, have a couple of news uh, type announcements where we let people know what's going on in the uh, in the UNSO community. So if I can share my screen here, share and present. The, uh, the first announcement uh, which I'd like to, to, to present uh, is that there is a, a new book that Fred Cummins has recently uh, published uh, online, uh, so it's freely available online, uh, and it's about joint speech. Uh, so I'm just going to read the text here on the right in case it's not easy to read in the video uh, that's on YouTube afterwards. Uh, joint speech is produced when multiple speakers say the same thing at the same time. It is thus central to ritual, collective protest, and many ways in which collectives enact their identity. This book summarizes the little empirical work that has been done on joint speech and phonetics, neuroscience, movement science, etc. But the main theme is the absence of a scientific framework suited to dealing with enacted collective entities. An active theory is drawn on as a useful way of treating of joint speech. The book is available as a free PDF download formatted for large screens or for phones, and it can be found at jointspeech.ucd.ie slash index.php slash book. So I will do my best to remember to put a link to that up uh, in the discussion on the ENSO page so that you have a nice clickable button rather than having to copy that out of the YouTube video. Uh, and Fred asks us to please feel free to distribute the book uh, wide, widely. Um, so that's the first of two uh, news announcements. The other one is a little bit uh, perhaps selfish. It's coming from me. Um, and this is related to a project that I've recently uh, uh, been awarded some funding from the Royal Society of New Zealand to investigate. Um, it's an inaction-inspired approach to understanding the origins of life. Um, so the idea here is that usually when people think about and talk about the origins of life, they focus on how certain types of molecules came to be. So how you could have a chemistry uh, that's capable of undergoing evolution. And the assumption uh, in that view is often that once you have evolving chemistry, that will create an increase in complexity and eventually you'll have complex organisms like what we see on Earth today. But this is quite a big assumption and, and we still don't quite understand how evolving chemistry could turn into integrated organisms. And this is a project that I'm hoping to investigate where we're going to look at a couple of simple physical non-biological systems, such as the motile oil droplets studied by uh, Martin Hanchik, and these interesting self-organizing ball bearing systems uh, called ramified charge transportation networks. And these are systems that are not biological, but demonstrate some really interesting forms of self-preserving behavior, where they move towards the energy and other resources that they need to persist. Um, and the idea in this research program is to, to think about how these physical behaving systems uh, might have facilitated the emergence of evolution and played a role in the earliest stages of, of life's evolution. So it's going to be, it's a PhD scholarship to work on this for, for three uh, plus years uh, with me in Auckland in New Zealand. Um, and it will uh, include a scholarship and a stipend for living expenses. Um, and I'm imagining that it will primarily be a PhD rep, uh, based on computational modeling, but it will also include some empirical investigation of these systems uh, and international collaboration with Martin Hanchik and with others. So if you're interested, please go to my website, matthewegbert.com, and, uh, and, and shoot me an email or read some of the documents I have there with a bit more details about the scholarship. Um, that's it for the, the news and announcements for, for uh, this week or this month. Uh, I hope that others uh, will, will start sending in their news. We're really quite happy to use this as a way for people to, to reach out to the community. If you've got a paper you're really excited about that you think this community would be interested in, um, you can send me a, a one slide uh, description of it. Uh, try to keep it brief um, and, uh, and we'll try to, to, to promote uh, material that we think is interesting to this community. Um, so it's about five minutes past now, so I think we'll get started shortly. Uh, what I will do, we've got a number of people who have joined, so I'm glad we, we waited till now uh, to, to start. Um, I would just do one last quick announcement before we start, Randy.
which is uh, to, to remind everybody that you can join these discussion sessions live. Um, and the way to do that is preferably before the event starts to send me an email. Um, and then I can send you a link which allows you to join the session as a participant rather than just as a viewer. Um, and then you can ask questions during the Q&A at the end of the session um, and, and so on. Uh, if, you don't, if you can't manage to make it live, but you do want to ask questions, uh, we encourage you to do that by way of the ENSO website, where if you find the page for this talk, so not the page for Inman's talk that's uh, shown on the right, but if you find the page for this talk, at the bottom of it, there is a discuss uh, forum where you can uh, quite easily register for an account and, and join in the conversation, and I will monitor that and make sure that Randy's aware of questions that are asked uh, after the fact and has a chance to, to respond to them if he has time to. Um, OK, that's it for the administrative announcements. Um, I will stop sharing my screen, and I will start showing uh, Randy's screen. Um, this, is, this is Randy Beer. It's my great pleasure to have Randy here today. Uh, he, uh, He's perhaps uh, he's based at Indiana University and is perhaps uh, best known for uh, his research on uh, evolutionary robotics, where he's looked at situated, uh, embodied, and dynamical uh, approaches uh, to understanding cognition, um, and and he's done that work for quite a while now. But back in two thousand four, he had a paper uh, entitled "Autopoiesis and Cognition in the Game of Life," um, and for me, this was quite an important paper for for trying to finally understand what was going on in a lot of the inactive literature. Um, and that paper uh, led to some a couple of papers more recently where, again, Randy has been looking at the game of life, Conway's game of life, to try to try to uh, unfold some of the, the ideas that Varela and Maturana and others since them have, uh, have talked about in, in terms of inaction. So I believe this is going to be the topic of today's talk. Uh, and it's, it's great to have you here, Randy. Thanks for coming. Um, and I'll turn it over to you now uh, to give your to give your seminar. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah. Let, me Let me share, share the screen here. Great. That looks great. I can see it from my end. Okay, good. Well, then I will go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I've been interested in Maturana and early Varela's work on the biology of cognition and its grounding in autopoiesis for quite some time now, since about 1985, actually. And um, I think it provides an important framework for a sort of much needed rethinking of fundamental issues in biology and its relation to the physical world and also in cognition and its relation to biology. But I've always felt that this framework requires a lot more theoretical development in order to have the impact that it really deserves. And uh, the work that Matthew mentioned uh, on dynamics of brain body environment systems that I've spent most of my career doing really began as an attempt to flesh out some of the implications of Maturana and Varela's ideas uh, for neural activity and behavior. But, but over the years, I've gotten sort of increasingly interested in the entire framework that they proposed and how all of its different pieces fit together into an integrated whole. And I think this has become particularly relevant with the rise of inaction because the key ideas of inaction, I think, are built rather directly on this earlier work by Maturana and Varela, even if they generalize and extend those ideas in a variety of different ways. So Matthew asked me to summarize some of this work I've been doing recently in this area. And in particular, he wanted me to try to do it in a way that explains how my approach to this, to this work is grounded in Maturana and Varela's writings. And I thought that was maybe a bit too ambitious for a 20 to 30 minute talk, um, but I agreed to sort of give it a try for at least the autopoiesis part of, uh, of the work alone. So that's what I'm gonna focus on here today. So in 1972, Maturana and Varela proposed this idea of autopoiesis as a kind of organizational principle that's common to all living systems. And they were really looking for a way to, to sort of transcend the details of any particular material instantiation of living systems, and hopefully to have a common principle from which one could derive the sort of secondary characteristics of living systems that we generally associate with life. So this word autopoiesis actually comes from the Greek roots, auto uh, meaning self and poiesis meaning creation. 
And the classic statement of autopoiesis goes all the way back to the first publication in 1973 by Maturana and Varela. And I'm just going to quote that as a place to start thinking uh, from. So they say an autopoietic machine is, organ is a machine organized as a network of processes of production, transformation, and destruction of components that produce the components which, one, through their interactions and transformations, continuously regenerate and realize the network of processes that produce them, and two, constitute the machine as a concrete unity in the space in which the components exist by specifying the topological domain of its realization as such a network. That's quite a mouthful. Um, we're going to try to unpack it a little bit here today. The first thing I'll note is that these two conditions have, I think, increasingly become come to be referred to as self-production and self-individuation. And uh, another way of looking at this verbal definition is visually, uh, in terms of a diagram that kind of illustrates the essential circularity of what's going on here. So we have a bounded system uh, that generates a network of processes that produces a set of components that determine the original bounded system. And probably the best way to think about autopoiesis is an attempt at abstracting the metabolism and membrane of a living cell. And as evocative of the, as this sort of verbal or graphical description is, it's always seemed to me that it's crying out for a somewhat more formal interpretation. And that's kind of the, the direction I've been uh, trying to push things for a while. So my standard approach to pushing conceptual frameworks like this towards something closer to what I might consider a theory is to analyze toy models. And by the way, I should mention that when I use the word theory, I use it in a particular, uh, particularly strong sense in that I think a theory is something you actually can calculate things with. So you ultimately ought to be able to formulate a mathematical version of some question and calculate an answer to that question. So that's my end goal as far away as it may be. Uh, so for this work, I chose Conway's Game of Life, as Matthew mentioned, which is a binary cellular automaton. And uh, the most important thing for, about the Game of Life for us is that when you run it for random initial conditions, uh, you end up with these bounded persistent entities that consistently arise. And I'm highlighting 12 of the most common ones here, but hundreds of them have been cataloged and studied by Game of Life enthusiasts. And I'm going to focus in particular on the glider, uh, which is the simplest motile entity in the Game of Life. And the question I basically want to ask here as a way to try to sharpen this notion of autopoiesis is, is a glider, is this thing in the Game of Life, uh, can it be considered as an autopoietic system? And I want to emphasize here that this is a little different from the usual approaches that people take to sort of modeling autopoiesis, and that I'm not constructing a model here uh, of autopoiesis given this definition. Rather, I'm trying to apply this definition of autopoiesis to these emergent entities that arise in the game of life. So in previous work, I've, pretty, I've worked pretty much directly from this verbal definition that I've given in the previous slide, but in this approach, in this talk, I thought I'd take a little different approach. And um, in particular, shortly after uh, Maraturana and Varela proposed the idea of autopoiesis, Varela, Maturana, and, and Uribe, Uribe uh, published what amounts to the very first computational model of autopoiesis. And in that paper, they proposed a six step test for deciding whether or not a system. Uh, should be considered to be autopoietic. And what I want to do is try to apply those six criteria to a glider. So before we begin, I want to start by noting that these six criteria really fall into two classes. The first three criteria are more like preconditions that have to be established before we can even start talking about the terms used in the definition of autopoiesis. And then the second three uh, criteria really correspond to uh, determining whether or not we have an autopoietic system according to that definition. And they're, I think, better uh, approached as a unit. So I'm going to be uh, doing that at, in what comes. So let's just go through each of these six criteria step by step. I'm going to read you the criteria quoted directly from the paper 
and then talk about uh, the issues and applying it to uh, a glider in the game of life. So the first test that they suggest is that one should determine through interactions if the unity has identifiable boundaries. If the boundaries can be determined, proceed to step two. If not, the entity is indescribable and we can say nothing. So basically this restriction attempts to ensure that we're dealing with what Maturana and Varela call a simple unity. Uh, this is a whole that we as scientific observers can distinguish from the general background of our experience. And it's a whole whose properties we can actually study via our interactions with this entity. So this condition, this precondition is pretty obviously uh, satisfied by a glider, but I want to not take the easy route. I want to actually try to operationalize this, this criteria. And I'm going to do it by uh, systematically perturbing the sites in the game of life universe and observing the consequences that they have for a glider. So if we do that, we'll find that these white cells that are showing in the slide right now, um, if we perturb them, they have no immediate effect on a glider. If we move inward toward this putative entity, this putative unity that we're referring to as a glider, what we'll eventually find is that these orange cells, if we perturb a few of them in particular ways under particular circumstances, we can have an effect on the glider in the next step. Moving inward further, if we perturb any of the yellow cells here, we will definitely have a one-step effect on the glider. And finally, if we perturb any of these brown cells, we'll immediately destroy the glider. So I want to point out that this first criterion determines that there are boundaries to a glider, but it doesn't necessarily uniquely fix them. And I'll talk more about that as we move forward. The second test is the following. Determine if there are constitutive elements of the unity, that is, components of the unity. If these components can be described, proceed to step three. If not, the unity is an unanalyzable whole and therefore not an autopoietic system. So this restriction attempts to ensure that we're dealing with what Maturana and Varela call a composite unity. And the basic idea here is if you want to know how a given simple unity actually generates its properties, then you have to open it up and look inside. So we're effectively reinterpreting this, this uh, undifferentiated whole of a simple unity in terms of its components and their interactions. And again, this precondition is trivially satisfied in a glider because a glider is actually made up of particular arrangements of what I'm going to call one components and zero components in the game of life. Okay. So the next step is to determine if the unity is a mechanistic system. That is, the component properties are capable of satisfying certain relations that determine in the unity the interactions and the transformations of these components. If this is the case, proceed to step four. If not, the unity is not an autopoietic system. So uh, this restriction is an attempt to ensure that we're dealing with what Maturana and Varela call a structure determined system. And the idea here is that in order to be scientifically explainable, all of the phenomena that the unity generates must ultimately arise from what they call its structure which is basically just a word for the totality of concrete properties and relations of its instantiation. So uh, if that's not true, if it's not, uh, if those properties aren't ultimately grounded in its structure, then either we've chosen a poor componentization, that is we've broken it up in the wrong way, or there's some sort of supernatural effects going on here that can't be explained in terms of the underlying instantiation of this unity. Again, this, con this condition is obviously satisfied in the game of life. Why? Because we know a priori the sort of fundamental theory of everything underlying the game of life. Um, this is this sort of Conway physics, you might call it, completely exhausts the causal power in the game of life. Everything that happens happens because of this universal law. Um, However, for what we're going to be doing shortly, I think a better description than this sort of physical description 
of what's going on in the game of life in general and particularly in a glider uh, corresponds to something like an artificial chemistry. So in this description, what we focus on is, in, is actual local arrangements of components, that is local arrangements of zeros and ones that trigger processes that produce new local arrangements of components. And several examples of these are given in the example column of this little table on the right. And the main reason why I think that this uh, sort of artificial chemistry oriented description is a better one is that it makes the spatial dependencies of components more explicit, in a, as I'll show you in a moment, um, than does the sort of phys the universal law of the Conway physics. Okay, the next three criteria, as I mentioned, are of a somewhat different character than the first three preconditions. And I'm going to walk you through them individually so you can see what uh, Maturana and Varela and Oribe wrote, uh, but I'm not going to look at how they apply to, the, gar to the, gl the glider yet. I'm going to wait till all three criteria are stated and as I mentioned earlier, I think they're better applied as a unit. Um, however, what I am going to do is, um, when I, after I've presented the criteria, I want to give you an example of what I think they're trying to exclude by stating that criteria. And then we'll return to the glider. So the fourth test reads as follows. Determine if the components that constitute the boundaries of the unity constitute these boundaries through preferential neighborhood relations and interactions between themselves as determined by their properties in the space of their interactions. If this is not the case, you do not have an autopoietic unity because you are determining its boundaries, not the unity itself. If four is the case, however, proceed to step five. Okay. So I think the basic idea of what they're trying to exclude here um, is uh, illustrated in the following. Suppose I'm an artist whose medium of expression is the game of life universe. And in what I do is I compose aesthetically pleasing arrangements of zero components and one components. Now, in order to best communicate my artistic intention in doing this, I may choose, I may carefully choose a framing of these arrangements, okay? Such as the one shown here. But although such a framing separates my composition from its surroundings, it does not constitute a self-determined boundary because it's exposed externally by me as the artist, not by this arrangement of zeros and ones. So it's not generated internally, it's, it's imposed externally. So this is an example of the kind of boundary that I think this fourth criterion is trying to exclude as to not being acceptable. Okay, the fifth step, the fifth test says, determine if the components of the boundaries of the unity are produced by the interactions of the components of the unity, either by transformation of previously produced components or by transformations and or coupling of non-component elements that enter the unity through its boundaries. If not, you do not have an autopoietic unity. If yes, proceed to step six. So part of the issue here, I think, is that uh, determining your own boundary in part involves constructing or maintaining it yourself. So external agents doing it for you is not allowed. So if we have some external process like this ghostly arm reaching in from the outside, constantly preventing a glider from falling apart by pushing its boundary back into the position it needs to be in, then that's not an example of self-production of the boundary. Something else is producing the boundary, something else is maintaining it. The entity or the unity itself is not doing it. Interestingly, this, this uh, criterion has an exception for raw material that can enter through the boundary and be transformed into components. The sixth and final test reads as follows. If all the other components of the unity are also produced by the interactions of its components, as in five, and if those which are not produced by the interactions of other components participate as necessary permanent constitutive components in the production of other components, then you have an autopoietic unity in the space in which its components exist. If this is not the case, 
And there are components in the unity not produced by components of the unity, as in five, or if there are components of the unity which not, do not participate in the production of other components, then you do not have an autopoietic unity. So the thing that um, is being excluded here is just that not only are the boundary components uh, required to be produced by the unity itself rather than externally imposed on it, but the other components that don't necessarily form part of the boundary must also be produced internally and not externally arranged and imposed. Again, there's an exception in this uh, test, which is interesting to point to, and that is that permanent components are allowed to exist, which do not need to be produced by uh, the entity itself, but neither are they produced by other things. They're permanent over the lifetime of the entity. I also want to emphasize the part of this uh, test that's in italics, that's in the original, that's not mine, um, that if all six of these conditions are satisfied, then you have an autopoietic unity in the space in which its components exist. That's going to be important in a few moments. Okay, so as I said, I've, these last three uh, criteria, I've just gone through and read them and presented what I think amounts to a counterexample. But now what I need to do is show how those three criteria are satisfied by some interpretation of what's going on in a glider. Uh, in particular, what we need to do is we need to identify networks of processes, and we need to ensure that these networks are self-producing and self-individuating, rather than being externally produced and externally uh, individuated. And I want to do that by recalling the sort of chemistry description of the game of life that I briefly mentioned a number of slides ago. And in that description, what we had was we have arrangements of components, such like the one shown on the left here, which trigger a set of processes, two of which I've shown here in the middle of this uh, illustration. Uh, and those processes in turn produce new arrangements of components, like the one I've shown on the right. So we have arrangements of components triggering processes which produce new arrangements of components. That's the what, am, what amounts to the chemistry description of the game of life that I pointed to earlier. Now, in most cases, the new arrangements of components that are produced by this set of processes are going to be completely different than the original arrangement of components. We see here the first arrangement and the second arrangement are completely different. And if we carry this fur further forward in time, that second arrangement will produce another arrangement and so on. So that's the typical situation. The vast majority of arrangements of components in the game of life generate new arrangements of components. But there are some special arrangements of components, like the one I've shown here, um, that have a particular property which is that they generate processes that produce the same set of components that triggered the set of processes. So we have an arrangement of components that trigger a set of processes that produce the same arrangement of components. Another way of saying that is we have sets of processes that produce components that enable the very same set of processes that produce them. In either case, what we have is a kind of closed loop of relations between a set of components arranged in a particular configuration and a set of processes, so that the arrangement of, of components generate the processes, and the processes generate the same arrangement of components. We have this ongoing sort of circular loop of, of things. And I think it's important here to notice that what's being produced is not just the components here in, in this diagram, the four one cells, but also the relations between the components that are necessary for those components to re-enable the processes that produce them. So if we had a set of processes that just produced four one components scattered in some arbitrary arrangement in the game of life universe, then this closed loop wouldn't work. It's not just that we have four one components, it's that they're arranged in this particular way. 
Now, since the focus of autopoiesis is on network of process, networks of processes, what I want to do is rearrange this diagram to emphasize the processes and de-emphasize the components that make that trigger them. And one way to do that is just to um, essentially write down the four processes that are involved here. And I've drawn an arc from the center of each process, which is just the particular component that it produces or maintains, to, uh, to the roles that that component plays in the other processes, so that we can sort of visualize this, uh, this process network as a closed network of interdependent processes, so that, which mutually enable one another. And then what we have is the entire set of processes, in this case, these four processes, is essentially self-sustaining. It's, it, it's an invariant organization with respect to the Conway chemistry, if you will. Now, this particular uh, arrangement has a name in the game of life. It's called a block in game of life parlance, and it's actually the simplest persistent structure that you can have in the game of life. Traditionally, that term block refers only to this two by two square of one cells or one component that I've been talking about. And the next thing I want to do is give you three reasons why I think that terminology is insufficient from the point of view of autopoiesis, which we're trying to apply uh, here. So the first argument uh, is grounded in the following observation. Here is an arrangement of, of uh, components in the game of life. And the question to ask yourself is how many blocks are in this arrangement? Now, depending on how you, uh, you match that two by two uh, arrangement of one cells to this picture, you can identify four different blocks, one in the upper left-hand corner, the upper right-hand corner, the lower left-hand corner, and the lower right-hand corner. Or you might identify nine different blocks if you allow overlapping possibilities. Um, or, and this is the point I want to emphasize, you could say that there are no blocks in this uh, arrangement of components. And in fact, no game of, uh, Garden of Eat, Garden, sorry, no game of life enthusiast would identify any blocks in this configuration. And that suggests that there's something more going on than just the two by two arrangement of one cells when people talk about blocks in the game of life. Even if you want to insist that, in fact, there are one or more blocks in this configuration, the second reason why I don't think uh, that's how we should define a block is that none of those blocks persist the way a block would. So if we actually evolve this arrangement of four by four, uh, one components forward in time, we end up with this sort of ring of components, none of which in turn is a block. So any block you might have identified in the first configuration is not preserved. It does not persist the way a block is supposed to. And finally, if you just take this two by two arrangement of one components and drop them into an empty game of life universe, that, and look at the processes that those block that though that that supposed block actually enables. You'll see not only the four uh, processes indicated with the dark center, but also a set of uh, processes surrounding those, um, which are there. They are essential to the operation of the block as a block. That is, if you disrupt those outer ring of processes, then again, the block will no longer persist uh, the way a block is supposed to. So for at least those three reasons, I suggest that what we really need to think of as a block from an autopoetic point of view is not just the four core one cells, but also the surrounding boundary of zero cells um, that are both that both enable and are enabled by the one cell processes. And so what we really have is this extended picture that I'm showing here on the bottom left with um, 16 components on the left, four one components and 12 um, uh, zero components, which are in a circular relationship with this set of 16 processes 
shown on the right against the background of what I call null processes. And again, if we actually, uh, if we get rid of the underlying components and just focus on the dependency structure of the processes, then we can extract uh, this dependency network which is an extension of the network I showed on the previous slide. And this is what I want to call a glider. I'm sorry, a block. This is what I want to call the full block organization. It's this, in, again, an invariant uh, network of mutually interdependent processes that persist and maintain themselves uh, in the game of life universe. So the same process I just went through for a block can be applied to much more interesting entities in the game of life, including back to our original goal, the glider. So if we look at a glider and unfold its behavior over time, what we see is a sequence of four uh, arrangements of components, each of which enable a different set of processes, but ultimately that, uh, that cycle closes into a four-step uh, sequence of set arrangement of components, set of processes, arrangement of components, set of processes, and so on, until we have a new arrangement of components, which, by the way, is not in the same location in the Game of Life universe because gliders move, but the set of processes that that new configuration enables is exactly the same set of processes that the original configuration enabled. So if we extract, as I did for the block, the set of processes involved in this four cycle and the mutual dependency between them, then we get a network of interdependency that looks like this, where I've simplified the nodes a bit um, because this network is much more complicated. So this is a schematic representation. There is a node for each process, but the processes themselves are just represented by colored circles rather than the three by three structure of which cells enable which other cells. You could do that, but it would be much harder to visualize. So again, in the end, what we have here is a network of processes with an invariant organization that persists over time, even though the structure, the underlying set of components that make up these that, that generate, that, that um, enable these processes is constantly changing and moving. So let's step back and revisit uh, these definitions of autopoiesis that I gave earlier. And I'm going to look at three different versions now. Um, the first one is a sort of shorter verbal definition than the original one I gave that's taken from a paper by Varela from 1997 wherein he says an autopoietic system is a network of processes of production of components, which one, continuously regenerate and realize the network that produces them and constitute the system as a distinguishable unity in the domain in which they exist. The second thing I want to do is relist the six uh, criteria that uh, we drew from the 19... 74 paper by Varela, Maturana, and Uribe, where we had these six conditions, and I've tried to take you through each of them now, arguing that a glider is a simple unity. It can be reconceived as a composite unity by taking into account its constituent zero and one cells. It's a structure-determined system because it's grounded in the Conway physics, which we know and can write down mathematically. And then I've tried to show you in the past couple of slides how it has a boundary that's self-determined and self-produced, and the components that make up the system are self-produced as well. And finally, I want to return to the visual illustration that I gave earlier and show how a glider fits into this diagram. So we have a bounded system, where I'm showing here in one of its many structural variations, and that bounded system, by virtue of the structure determination of the interactions between its components, generates a network of processes, which we've characterized. That network of processes produces components and arrangements of components that in turn, sorry, that in turn 
determine the original bounded system that we started with. So what I'd like to suggest is the answer to the question, is a glider in the game of life autopoetic, is that yes, it is autopoetic with respect to the Conway physics or chemistry, if you prefer. The last point I want to make um, is that we started talking about living systems, and autopoiesis is supposed to ultimately be a kind of abstract characterization of living systems. So how is this supposed to apply back to the notion of a living system? We have this abstract um, idea of autopoiesis, which I've illustrated with this concrete example of a glider. Um, and here is where I want to remind you of that italicized uh, phrase that was in the sixth test from Varela, Maturana, and Urube, in Urube uh, which is that a, an autopoetic system is autopoetic in the space in which its components exist. And so what Maturana and Varela say in that same uh, document in which they introduced and described the idea of autopoiesis is that autopoiesis in the physical space is necessary and sufficient to characterize a system as a living system. So living systems instantiate, according to Maturana and Varela, this abstract autopoetic organization in the physical world. Of course, doing so in the physical world as opposed to in the abstract world of something like uh, the game of life involves much more complicated kinds of components than what we're dealing with. And it involves much more complicated networks of processes than the ones that we've been dealing with. But nevertheless, according to Maturana and Varela, uh, living systems themselves are, in a sense, just autopoetic systems, but instantiated in the real world. So according to this notion, is a glider alive? No, it's not, because it's not autopoetic with respect to the physical world. All right, let me wrap up with a final summary slide, and then I'll stop. So what I've tried to do here rather quickly, unfortunately, um, to fit the time constraints, is to give you an interpretation of autopoiesis um, in terms of the game of life that's rigor en rigorous enough to actually allow the calculation of organizations. Although I didn't go through any of the mathematical details, we can actually write down a piece of code that, that produces, extracts the organizations uh, of the sort I've just described to you for the glider for other entities in the game of life, or indeed in other cellular automata. So this is an interpretation that is grounded enough, that's mathematical enough, that's ultimately computational enough, that we can pull out these organizations uh, from the physics and chemistry of the cellular automata. Okay. Uh, it's also the case that some initial steps have been taken to applying this idea to more complicated emergent entities. And here I'll just point to a former student of mine, Aran Agman's work on uh, protocells, um, where we look at metabolism boundary co-construction and what amounts to a reaction diffusion orientation repulsion system described by a set of differential equations, um, although ultimately discretized on a very large lattice for, for integrating. And there's also ongoing work, which I described a couple of years ago um, at a workshop in which I will be hopefully submitting a paper shortly about trying to think about uh, some questions about the origin of life in terms of this interpretation of autopoiesis. I also want to mention that there's a whole other side to this, which I haven't talked about at all, um, of ongoing work which extends or, or applies this autopoetic interpretation of a glider to some of the ideas uh, in the broader biology of cognition that Maturana and Varela proposed. In particular, talking about perturbations and their effect and mapping out uh, domains of interaction and cognitive domains and structural coupling between uh, gliders and their environments. And finally, there's been a very, little, a very little bit of preliminary work, which I've also talked about at previous workshops and have not mentioned here, um, trying to interpret some aspects of an action, such as precariousness, uh, significance, and sense-making in terms of uh, this interpretation of a glider. But that, as they say, is another story. <laughs>
So I think I will stop there. Thank you. That's great, Randy. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. Um, and yeah, I, I, with regard to those other topics, uh, I do hope we get to uh, have you have you back for an additional ENSO seminar in the future, perhaps to talk about some of them. Um, we'll see how this goes first. <laughs> when I'll, 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 yeah. I'll twist your arm at some point. Um, so uh, I can now ask, we've had a couple people join us for the live session. So Merrick uh, and Mario are both here. So you guys can unmute yourselves now. I, I can't do that myself. Um, and I'll just mention for those of you that are watching but are not participating live, if you want to email a question to me, if I see it in time, I'm happy to pass that uh, question on to Randy uh, in this Q&A session that we'll have now. Um, and uh, with that, uh, maybe I thought I'd kick off a bit of the discussion, Randy, uh, by uh, relating to one of the, your last slides where you were talking about uh, relating these ideas back to biology. So uh, you had this, this image of uh, a bacterium and all of the complex interactions going on, all the, comp the uh, multiple components and, and this huge metabolic network. And the first thing that popped into my, to my mind was uh, dissipative structures. So for instance, some of the work that Martin Hamchick has done with these motile oil droplets, they've got uh, chemistry going on where you've got a sort of an autocatalytic reaction uh, that, that is forming these, these structures, you know, these convection cells and these oil droplets that are necessary for the autocatalytic reactions to continue. Do you think that it's possible that we can identify in these systems uh, something that that's autopoetic uh, in, in, in the way that you're, you're, you're proposing? I certainly think it's possible. Uh, I, I think the step that has to be, I mean, part of the problem and why I went through this exercise is that often autopoiesis is just sort of talked about by analogy to some extent. And whether you like it or not, I mean, a lot of people obviously have criticisms of, of the definition of autopoiesis, but when, depending, regardless of how you feel, there is actually a set of criteria that Maturana and Varela put forward. And I think what one would need to do is go through that criteria. Uh, and it's not so much that, that that will objectively determine whether you have an autopoietic system, I'm afraid. I think, I think the more correct way to say it is that if you can come up with a consistent interpretation of your system in terms of those criteria, then I think you're licensed in, uh, you're licensed to approach it as an autopoietic system and try to analyze it as such. If for, for some reason one or more of those criteria just can't be applied, then you know, strictly speaking at least, it's not an autopoietic system, although for example, it still may be a very interesting system in that it has some aspects that we see in you know, physical autopoietic systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I just got a note from, from Merrick who's saying that it's not possible for them to unmute themselves for some reason. Uh, um, that's gonna make well, questions. Yeah, that's gonna be difficult for them to ask questions. I've just tried to, uh, to change a setting, which hopefully uh, fixes that for them. Uh, so if you guys could try again, try to unmute yourself. Um, there's really nothing I can do. It says that you're muted, but there's no way for me to click to unmute you. So sorry about that, guys. You might want to try to rejoin is the only thing I can think. Um, and uh, in the meantime, Randy, I've got uh, another another question for you. OK, just uh, to be clear, did the first answer, does that make sense? or? I, yes, I, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would. If I were doing that, I would walk through the same criteria and try to again try to come up with an interpretation where each of the terms maps in this way to the system you're looking at. And if you can do that all the way through in a you know reasonably consistent manner, then I think you're licensed in thinking it of it as an autopoietic system. And if you can, I think that may highlight interesting features that are worth thinking more about. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess that sort of relates to the, to the other point that I was thinking of, of moving to, uh, okay. which is which is just relates to the difficulty of trying to apply these ideas to any real system. Yep. Um, you know, you've got you've got an ideal world. You've selected an ideal world in a sense. This toy problem, uh, this this toy world of the game of life, um, and and I love that methodology because it uh, it forces us. To, to consider all of the details that need to be, to go into actually applying these ideas, right? Um, so some of the, the constraints that you've come up with or the underdetermined aspects of the theory that you've come up with are, uh, are things like uh, you, ha you have to say, does this per perturbation affect the, the glider in the next single time step? Yep. And that's this sort of temporal constraint, which isn't in the original literature at all. And I imagine 
came to you pretty quickly as soon as you started trying to apply it to this real world toy yeah. system. Um, but Although I think there's an, a there's an analog of that in the physical world. I mean, if, if a star goes supernova four light years away from here right now, yeah. it is going, it could, I mean, actually four light years, it would have an impact here, but not for four years, right? And so you wouldn't normally think about that as determining part of my boundary. Yeah. So I'm not saying I've resolved the question, but I think highlighting it is important because it, it shows it's something you have to think about in any system, not just in this this toy example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think that there are, do you worry that there's so many of these underdetermined aspects of the theory, these, these, these arbitrary decisions that you've had to make, in, including trying to divide the system into different components that, that, that there's sort of, in a sense, that the theory can't hold its own, that there's really missing too much? Uh, so, or do you think that you can formally make, you can figure out ways to make all these decisions without... Uh, by the theory, are you referring to autopoiesis or my interpretation of it now? I because, am referring to... Okay, d distinguish the two for me then? I mean, autopoiesis is underdetermined because it's a verbal statement, right? And words are of necessity going to be have ambiguities associated with them. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to work this through in all of its detail, okay? Um, so what I think you're drawing attention to is the fact that there are many decisions that you have to make about those verbal ambiguities when you right. apply them to any specific system. And I think uh, the utility of doing this in this toy system is that you can't hide from any of those decisions by you know, showing lots of complicated graphs and things or experimental uncertainties and so on. There's no hiding behind any of that. You actually have to face each of these decisions. Right. Um, I don't see any way of resolving that until one has a formal statement, okay? So, so to me, what I've done is I have uh, one possible fleshing out of all of those things in terms of a particular physics, the game, the, the game of life physics. Um, and the question to me that you're asking is, as I apply that to other systems or in other situations, how much might I have to back off on some of those things or change them? And that I think is an open question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to the extent to which you want, one wants to hold up autopoiesis as a definition versus as a kind of, so I often use the words as, as denoting something versus connoting something. Okay, I don't think autopoiesis in either its verbal description or in any mathematization that I can conceive of at the moment is going to uniquely denote living systems and only living systems. On the other hand, I think it connotes, that is, it, it, it makes us think about these things in a particular way, which is exactly the right way that we need to be thinking about them. And so I tend to not get as hung up on definitions and what's in and what's out as, as what follows from taking this perspective on a system. What kinds of, how do we change the way we ask questions about the system? How do we change the way we look for answers to those questions and so on? Okay, so that's really different then than what you were saying early on in your talk about uh... It's, it's the other side of the spectrum in terms of your definition of a theory. So you had this idea early in your talk that this theory was quite a precise mathematical formulation. It is. Uh, it is about, you know, given each of the steps that I've made, you would calculate the same organization that I would if I gave, you know, if, if, I, if I didn't just give you this quick overview, but actually gave you the full mathematical development. Much more of it's in the paper than, than what I've been talking about here. Um, it, in that sense, you can calculate organizations. You can calculate the effects of perturbations, which I didn't talk about. You can calculate domains of interaction. All those things are perfectly well-defined things in the, ga in the game of life, given my definition of these various verbal terms in Maturana and Varela's writings. Okay? Furthermore, I I'm fairly sure, although I do not have an example of this, you could do it for other cellular automata. Okay? Mm -hmm. Asking me whether you could do it for some protocell model or for from some of these dissipative systems that you're looking at mm -hmm. is a much different question. That would and to me that goes back to re-examining the verbal description in light of this new kind of physics 
you know, than the game of life, the Conway physics, which I've focused on. And I think you have to revisit each of those terms and look at how you might cash them out. I would actually approach that whole thing a different way, but that's, a, that's another question. So. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thanks for that. Um, I, th I see Merrick is here and it looks like his muted icon is gone. So uh, yes, maybe I'll, I'll hand it over to Merrick for the next question and I can come back for a couple more. <laughs> can, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can. Hello. Yes, excellent. Um, hi, uh, Ronnie. Thanks a million for the talk. Um, that's, uh, that there's a sort of a lot of food for thought. Now, I'm afraid I had connectivity issues, so I may vanish unexpectedly and also um, missed some section of the talk um, toward the end. But I, what I found sort of intriguing was the way in which the your schematization of the um, the organizations and their dynamics um, prompted sort of ways of um, sort of thinking about autopoiesis and um, and in, there's one particular question about autopoiesis um, that I hadn't hadn't um, really articulated clearly before for me um, particularly the way in which the your um, definition includes the zero component um, cells in the um, in the organization itself yeah. and I'm wondering am I if I'm understanding it right is, is that would that be analogous to, in essence, the way in which a an organism cellular dynamics or, a, or any autopoietic entity's dynamics um, esp essentially specifies the viable the environment in which the organization remains viable? Um, that it, you know, if you mess with those cells, or if you if you mess with those uh, in the in the game of life, if you mess with those particular cells, the the zero cell boundary, um, your you're, you're basically putting the organization in, in a, an environment where it won't be viable anymore. Uh, I, I don't think about it as environment. I actually think of the yellow cells as the environment. And that comes out in the, in the biology of cognition stuff I didn't talk about. Um, okay. I think of these as the boundary. So they're actually part of the, the unity or the entity or, or whatever, the autopoietic system. Um, because the processes going on there are essential to the ongoing uh, existence of the system. Right. Right. Okay. And, yeah, and yeah. you're right. Well, I mean, th there's a lot of details I've skipped over here and Matthew, Matthew was referring to some of them. They're in the paper and in conversations. Um, there's this funny duality of zero components in this model. Um, mm. And I think that that's an artifact of only having essentially two states of any location in your universe. Right. Um, how I distinguish uh, those, the processes going on there in the boundary involving zero cells from the processes going on at some distance from the uh, glider also involving zero cells is in terms of the processes. So uh, the game of life has this interesting feature that it, it generally decays to quiescence. Okay. Yeah. Um, just like a uh, an actual physical system uh, approaches thermodynamic equilibrium, um, which is a maximal entropy sort of situation, uh, the game of life tends toward, it's not quite so simple, but it tends toward a vacuum state where almost all the cells are zero. It doesn't reach it completely, and that's because it's a, a dissipative system. It's not reversible, and so you get uh, you, you kind of get attractors into structures that persist without having to, to pull, throw any energy through them, uh, which you have to do in a, in a physically dissipative system. Um, but the way I look at it is when you have these, these uh, vacuum situations, all you have are networks of null processes. So if you, you have two choices, either you include those networks in everything, in which case there are no bounded entities in the game of life, right? Yeah. And it's not a useful model. But I mean, that's an interpretation you could argue. Be consistent. Either they are or they aren't, okay? Or you can argue that the vacuum process, as I call it, or the null process is something like what goes on in empty space in physics, right? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on, but you don't normally think of that as contributing to any other process, uh, say, at a chemical level or a biological level, um, so you, you view it as the background against which everything else happens, okay? And you can't do that with the zero components for reasons I tried to argue, but you can do it with the null processes. 
And that's yeah. the basis of the distinction I've made. And it's one of the, I mean, it's certainly open to discussion, right? It's one of those many decisions that Matthew was referring to, if you heard his question, I don't know, um, that one is forced to make explicit when you when you take this this approach of applying it to a particular concrete system. Yeah. Albeit a very simple okay, one. That makes ones Matthew's talking about. Yeah. Uh, no, that's cool. That makes a lot of sense. I guess one of the one of the other things that struck me, and, and this I'm, I apologize is more of a comment than a question, um, but it has to do with your um, when you diagrammed the dynamics of the glider and the the, the relationships between the processes. Um, it sort of made it very clear that there is a natural tempo or a natural time scale to the existence of the glider. And it's something that is kind of interesting about. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Except when you're perturbing the glider, you can change that time scale. Right. Okay. So, so um, that's it, that's it. Sort of normal unfolding in an otherwise empty universe. You're right. It has a natural tempo. Yeah. But if you're perturbing it, you can sort of you speed things up a little bit, basically, by forcing it to react to things on a faster time scale. Yeah. But I'm sorry, go ahead and um, finish. Yeah, well, no, I, I guess it just it, it clarifies um, some of the, the characteristics then that we might think about in terms of um, different types of complex organisms then as well, and, and the cognition that, that, that's involved. That there is, um, if we can identify the processes that matter to any given autopoetic system we can ex we can specify what its time you know it, its time parameters might be that there this is the the natural time course of as we might eventually want to get to human cognition or cellular interaction and so on yeah. Yeah, um, are... and i just found that a very appealing uh, and potentially very powerful um analytical tool there are certainly natural time scales here in the in the game of life. They're very discrete, right? They're going to be multiples of an integer. But uh, you're right. I think I think that concept does generalize to continuous situations as well. Great. So we just had uh, Mario manage to come in unmuted this time. So welcome, Mario. Do you have a question you want to ask, Randy? I am. Um, uh, yeah. Although perhaps I missed something already. Uh, let me know if I'm just repeating the question. Uh, I think uh, first, an opinion that I think is, is at least for me convincing that in the, in the domain of, of this formal game, we might say that those gliders are all poetics. Uh, once we understand that poiesis and production means what you, what you meant. Right. Uh, uh, um, having said that, uh, I would like to know how important is for you in in this uh, in the theory uh, the the fact that in the physical domain uh, every every process of production presupposes some thermodynamic and some energetic uh, preconditions that. Uh, and the canonical presentation, they, they say, of Maturan and Varela, they say, okay, we take for granted that whatever the means that a autopoietic system is achieved, all the physical and thermodynamic conditions are given, so, and that's it. Uh, nonetheless, I wonder, I, I have some difficulties with that, because if, if production in the physical domain is what defines a living being. Uh, I mean, autopoiesis in a, in a domain that is not physical is not a living being. So only production that implies energy and matter, I mean, uh, counts as, as living, okay? Um, I wanted to know how, how, if that is important for you uh, and, and in which way if you, we might, we might do something in terms of modeling in this formal system to add these components or not? Yeah, I, I mean, yes, it is important for talking about living systems. I absolutely agree. Um, that that second to the last slide was was essentially trying to acknowledge the, the point that you're making that physically instantiating autopoiesis is a whole other matter, and it involves uh, much more complicated kinds of components and much more complicated kinds of processes with constraints that are different from other quote unquote physics. Okay. 
Um, I, I mean, I think that is completely consistent with what Maturana and, and, and Varela said. Uh, you know, they, in 74, they proposed their own computational model and said it satisfied these criteria for autopoiesis, um, but they never claimed that, therefore, it was living, right? So I completely yeah. agree with that. Um, but, but Returning to the spirit of your question, uh, yes, I'm very interested, and this goes back to something Matthew was asking me about earlier, too. I'm very interested in uh, the way I look at it is as you reintroduce more physically realistic kinds of structures and properties to what I'm calling the physics, okay, in an abstract sense, um, how do the constraints change? How does the difficulty of assembling and maintaining an autopoietic system how are they impacted by that? And this gets back to what I was saying to you, Matthew, earlier, where I kind of said I have, a, I would approach it a different way. So this is the other way I would approach it. What I would do is take something like a cellular automata model, may not be the game of life, I, I'm not wedded to that, it, there's convenient reasons for starting with it, but um, take something like a cellular automata model and incrementally add more physical kinds of constraints to that model. So there are reversible cellular automata models, not just irreversible ones like the game of life. Um, there are driven cellular automata models where you can drive externally uh, something very much like an analog of energy. You can have non-equilibrium flows. You know, you, you have conservation of energy. And, and so, I mean, all these things can be reintroduced step by step. And what I would be inclined to do from a theoretical development point of view is to build from what we have rather than leaping to something that has all these features in them, but we have no idea how, how to begin with. And in fact, I've played a little bit with some of that. Um, so for example, uh, a really simple thing, this has never been published, but, but it's something that I've done some work on and I'd like to get to it. Uh, a very simple thing that you could do even with the game of life is to drive it externally. And what that looks like is basically by reaching in from the outside and flipping various zero cells on or one cells off. So you're sort of creating one components or zero components in a way that falls outside the physics. Yeah. Okay. Um, that may seem a little illegitimate, but in fact, it's what we do all the time. If you make the analogy with the game of life, not at the level of fundamental physics, but sort of at the level of chemistry, and we do have external flows coming in outside of the actual chemistry of the, of the biological system. So I've done that, and it's actually kind of cool because you get new kinds of entities that stabilize in the presence of these non-equilibrium flows of things, right? So there are still lifes, as they're called, like blocks that aren't stable in normal game of life physics, but if you're manually flipping a cell on, they stabilize around that. Okay, there are gliders in the sense of movable structures that won't hold together as they move normally, but by flipping bits in the right way that they can sort of keep relying on that sort of stream of ones coming in will stabilize and organize around that. So there's a simple way that you can introduce sort of flows into a system and essentially drive the, guard, the game of life out of equilibrium, and it can still generate stable structures around it. As I said, there are, there are uh, cellular automata that are reversible, that have conserved quantities. I mean, you can, you know, there, there was a big uh, thing in the 80s where people were trying to use cellular automata as actually a tool for modeling physics. So you can see all kinds of thermodynamics and, and stuff, models that people have built in cellular automata. I would move in that direction mm -hmm. and take this, uh, this mathematical characterization of autopoiesis that I have in this really simple case and look at what would be necessary as you add one of those complexities at a time and then the second one and so on. Cool. Is that exactly. a question, Mario? Or? That's very interesting. <laughs> um, another uh, question, observation is that um, seems to me that perhaps this uh, way of modeling this kind of processes is perhaps more promising than the way in which uh, originally Maturana and Barrera and Uribe uh, did it because um, as far as I can see, when I, when I, I analyzed the, that model, uh, you can realize that the process of production, I'm talking about the 74 paper, okay? I know what you mean. 
um, you can realize that the process of production uh, takes place before the membrane is built, okay? And, and not, nothing seems to prevent that if you place another star catalytic yeah, catalyst. Mm -hmm. component, catalyst component outside the membrane, the, the substrate is going to start to, again, produce the same component of the membrane. In other words, it doesn't seem clear, it doesn't uh, show the model that the membrane is an enabling condition for the production process. Because mm -hmm. the production process, as a matter of fact, started before having any membrane. So uh, it looks like the, the, the membrane is just a way of marking a, a unity, mm -hmm. a separation between something internal and external that looks like a cell, okay? But uh, the model doesn't show that that membrane is an enabled condition for the for the production processes because the production processes started from the beginning and and also because if you place another catalyst outside nothing seems to prevent the mm -hmm. the, the process the, the production is going to start again perhaps because no 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 restrictions constriction about energy a driving force is is operating there so mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that so I, I, I've not tried to analyze that original model. I mean, I, I think technically speaking, that model is not a cellular automata model. It's a, it's a lattice gas model, they're called, yeah. um, where you actually have what amount to mobile elements uh, that can move around on a grid background rather than sort of atomic or primitive states of that background itself. Um, I think those kinds of models, lattice gas models, are probably an important step on the way to more uh, biochemically realistic sorts of models. That's the kind of model that Iran, uh, Agman, I don't know if you heard my end slide or not, but that's the kind of thing he was looking at. It's the kind of thing that uh, Nathaniel looks at when you write down um, reaction diffusion equations, basically. They're simulated on lattices anyway, computationally, and effectively what you have are lattice gas models, not, not cellular automata models. Um, so I think that kind of model is a way we have to go. Whether or not their particular model does, I, I, I'm not familiar enough with the way the, the membrane works. If, as you say, the membrane just demarcates what's going on rather than actually enabling it, then I agree that doesn't seem to satisfy one of the uh, requirements of their own definition. But they must have thought it did because that, that, that set of six criteria were actually in the same paper as as yeah, that yeah. Uh, as that model, so but that is strange. Yeah. There's that paper by uh, Barry McMullen that, that looks at that model in, in quite a bit of detail and identifies a few places that uh, that it sort of comes short of of the criteria that that Varela and, and Matrana had for autopoiesis, if I recall correctly. Yeah, which one are you talking about? Paper? It's a 2000. Okay. I think it's a 2001 paper by Barry McMullen. Uh, point of that paper make explicit uh, one reaction rule that wasn't in the paper, but turned out to be necessary to reproduce yeah. the result. It's an inhibition, inhibition component of right. yes. aggregation or bounding inside the cell, yeah. Um, so I'd like to, if I could ask another question, sort of uh, step back for a moment here uh, and ask you, Randy, what, what do you think the, a theory of autopoiesis is, is really going to, to get us in, in broad strokes? And I want to sort of clarify that question a little bit. Um, so I know a number of people have been focusing in recent years on, on how autopoiesis provides you with uh, a way to distinguish agent from environment. And further than that, to start to talk about normativity from the perspective of, of the agent and saying, here we have this, this, this entity which depends upon its own uh, actions for its own persistence, and then there are then things that are good and bad for its persistence, and that can be the basis of, of, of a normativity that's not coming from our mouth exactly, but coming from the organization of the structure we're investigating. Um, and then some of that also relates a little bit to notions of, of sensory motor inaction and so on, but I'm just curious what your what your take on is on what the value of a theory of autopoiesis is and how what your take is on connecting it to topics of normativity and agency. I mean, 
you had to pick normativity and agency because those are two that <laughs> I, I, I don't fully understand what people want to mean by some of those things um, myself. So I, I, it's hard to know uh, what a more fleshed out sort of theoretical framework for auto policemen might have to say about them. I do think, and, and you've, you've seen this other places, that um, I think it does it does make it possible to ground out those, these intuitions of, of a point of view, which are a perspective on the environment. Uh, Umwelt is, is sort of more the word that I prefer to use because it's got more of a history to it. But, but regardless, um, there are some features of that which I think you can ground out in this story, and there are others I'm not sure they can be grounded out. I, I guess I just don't know. I understand them enough sometimes as to what they want to mean. So with normativity, to take an example, um, I think it's pretty clear that within the game of life universe, I always have to add that qualifier, but within the game of life universe, um, there is at least one norm that a glider existing creates, right? Uh, and that is the norm of its continuing to exist, the things that are good for that and the things that are bad for that. Right. Um, how one actually interprets that, though, is already a very controversial issue. In the original Maturana and Varela framework, that's, that's an observation by an observer of the situation of the agent and its relation to of the entity and its relation to the environment. As I understand it within an activism, uh, and within later Varela, that's actually supposed to carry more weight. It's supposed to be an intrinsic thing. Somehow it's the root of intrinsic normativity and intrinsic teleology and all these other things that get built out of it. And um, I'm less convinced by that. And so I, it's not clear. It's not as clear to me how one might examine such things in these simple models. So that's what I meant at the very end about there are parts of an action which I think can be nicely illustrated and explored within this model, and there are parts that cannot, at least currently. The other thing I would mention, if I can answer a, a different part of your question, um, in that original 2004 paper, I made this point, and I'm not sure anybody's ever really followed on it, but I view all of the dynamics of brain-body environment systems, all of what's now called sensory motor in action, as focusing on the right side of that physics slash chemistry to biology to cognition end of things. And uh, I still think there's a lot to be done there that doesn't necessarily need this full fleshing out of autopoiesis, right? I mean, a lot of work in an action actually rejects the whole autonomy side of things and just focuses on what used to be called brain-body-environment interaction. Now, now it's called sensory motor in, a in action and so on. But um, that is, it's just the uh, circular... Uh, dynamic unfolding of a system interacting with its environment and the environment interacting back on that system through a body. So I think one can explore, there's still a lot of aspects of that can, that can be explored by taking something like autopoiesis for granted. And I'm more interested in, in looking at the overlap between the two by pushing autopoiesis into at least pieces of that domain. And that's part of what biology of cognition was all about. I mean, an important one of many important points Maturana and Varela made is you don't need a nervous system to behave. Uh, and nervous systems are particularly uh, useful uh, for richer and richer kinds of couplings between an agent and its environment because you have the, all these non-directly metabolic degrees of freedom that you can sort of use to structure your interactions in more and more complicated kinds of ways. So that's not to say nervous systems are at all irrelevant or, or something. I've spent most of my life modeling nervous systems, right? Um, but you can study a lot of these issues of behavior and interaction and even uh, significance and uh, at least biological norms and so on without necessarily having a nervous system. And those to me are the more interesting targets with this kind of work. Do you think that there are things that autopoetic systems can do that non-autopoetic systems cannot do in principle? See, I, I, don't, I don't like those kinds of questions be, because 
I mean, it gets down to things like, do you think there are neurons that don't have delay? There are things that neurons that have delay can do that the neurons that without delay can do. And I know you, that's relevant to you. Um, I think what's more interesting is when you look at delay, say, or when you look at autopoiesis, it causes you to approach a whole cluster of questions in a different way than you might otherwise. And I'm more interested with it, what kind of consequences of adopting that other perspective might be. Um, I feel like that's the same question. You're, you're saying, you know, when we look at systems from this perspective of autopoiesis. Yours, yours feels more like some sort of a, like, are there things a dynamical system can do that a computational system cannot do? I don't think that that's a meaningful question. Yeah, I don't like that question. Yeah. yeah. And I think what you're, the way I interpreted what you're asking is much closer to that. Whereas what I would say in the computational dynamical thing is, are there things I can learn about a system from thinking about it dynamically that I can't learn think from thinking about it computationally or vice versa? And that's more what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to look at this whole complex of issues from physics and, and chemistry all the way through biology to cognition from the perspective of, of autopoiesis and the biology of cognition. And to some extent, perhaps an action. Again, I, there are parts of an action that I understand very well how I think they ex attempt to extend uh, the biology of cognition. And there are parts of it that I don't understand. Uh, they seem like additions that aren't natural to me. And, and that may just be my own limitation. But so I've tended to focus on autopoiesis and biology of cognition, because I think it's in some sense a more a more systematic, a more developed uh, set of ideas that I can see how to try to formalize, how to mathematize in the context of concrete models better. Again, that could be my own limitation, but, but that's why I've tended to focus more on that end of things. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, uh, I think we should probably uh, wrap up there. Uh, it's been a great seminar. Thank you so much, Randy, for your time. And thank you, Marek, for joining. And Marek, unfortunately, had some connection issues. So uh, he had to bow out a little bit early. But he said he sent me a message saying he really enjoyed the talk. Um, and I'm sure he would have preferred to have been able to stay here and participate more. Um, again, for those of you watching uh, on YouTube after the fact, you can ask questions on, on the ENSO seminar website. And I'll pass this on to Randy or encourage him to check the, the site. And uh, if you have news you want to announce in the next ENSO seminar, uh, please let me know. We've got a good schedule coming up for the rest of the year. So I hope you'll join us for some of those talks. And that's it from us now. Thanks again, Randy. Thank you. All right, bye for now.